Romans 7, 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. We find in verse 14, in a nutshell, a revelation of what we are. We are carnal. I am carnal. As a consequence of what we are, we're told in verse 15 that we do those things that we do. I'll say it again. We do what we do because we are what we are. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. This is reiterated in verses 17 through 20. That we do what we do because we are what we are. Verse 7 tells me what we are. What I am, a sinner, sin dwelleth in me. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Verse 20 repeats it again. Sin dwelleth in me. These are declarations of what we are. And as a consequence, verse 19 reiterates to us that we do what we do. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. No wonder in verse 24, and we didn't read it a moment ago, but I'll read it to you now, O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We are what we are because of the nature with which we were born. What a wretched man. Now, keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul that is writing under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. In other words, it's Paul who is calling himself a wretched man. It is Paul who is expressing the struggle he's having with his own carnality, with his body of this death. Paul. Well, Paul arguably was among the ten greatest Christians that ever lived. Wouldn't you agree? Maybe the top five. Some would argue the top. And that should bring conviction because if Paul is having this struggle, then who am I? 
If Paul is struggling this way, should we expect anything different, any struggle that's any less than what he faced? Oh, wretched man that I am. I'm bringing the message that I've entitled, Why We Do What We Do. And the emphasis that I will repeat on purpose is that we do what we do because we are what we are. He asks, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But the implication is that there is one that can deliver me from the body of this death. We can be delivered. Amen. Father, please help us as we consider this important message of why we do what we do. And give us the victory that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. We begin with the premise that we do what we do because we are what we are. You cannot change what you are by changing what you do. You must change what you do by changing what you are. And we are what we are, beloved, because we think what we think. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It, uh, it begins with a problem in our thinking. If you'll turn the page to chapter 8, we see this expressed in verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, that's what we are, they that are after the flesh do mind, that's what we think, do mind the things of the flesh, that's what we do. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. We cannot change what we are by changing what we do. In other words, turning over a new leaf will not change what you are. It's a mistake to try to change what you do by changing what you do. <laughs> Sorry. You've got to be changed in what you are in order to change what you do. You must be changed in what you are before you can be changed in what you do. Verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's a thinking process that must change We cannot change by doing. That is to say, you cannot change what you are by behaving differently than you've behaved before. Verse 7 tells us, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind cannot be subjected to the law of God. No matter how much you try to beat it into subjection, it is an impossibility. Because what must change is what we are. What we are in our true being. That's why, beloved, you can't get to heaven by behaving differently. A person doesn't get to heaven by cleaning up his or her life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 should be a verses, uh, two verses that you have memorized. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest the man should boast, or lest any man should boast. We don't 
change what we are by works. Even if we do have works, our works do not impress God. Because our works do not change what we truly are. You understand this? Why are you a sinner? Because you commit sin? No, you commit sin because you're a sinner. We commit sin because we're sinners. We didn't start we didn't start out innocent. That's a false doctrine. My daughter's about to have a baby. That little thing is not innocent. The Bible says they come out of the womb lying to you. And that's the truth. More than you want to believe. We are what we are because of our nature. And we cannot change what we are by changing what we do. God must change what we are. Amen. And when God changes what we are, the consequence will be a change in what we do. Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as an unclean thing. That's what we are. All our righteousnesses, that is what we do, our righteousnesses, what we do, are as filthy rags. What we are is an unclean thing, and therefore what we do, even if they're good things, are as filthy rags in God's sight. And we all do fade as a leaf. That's what we are. And our iniquities, that's what we do. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And so we cannot change what we are by changing what we do. I started to quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I think I, in, I quoted those verses in their entirety. Let me quote them again. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now verse 10. For we are what we are when we're saved. God must change what we are. And when he does, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's what we do. In other words, the product of being changed in what we are is the good works that God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. Or be foreordained that we should walk in them. So, how does God change what we are? In Romans 12, verse 2, we're told, Be not conformed to this world. That's what we do. But be ye transformed. That's what we are. Transformed in what we are. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's what you think. You are what you are because you think what you think. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. When we change our mind and think differently about God and God's holiness, about sin and our own wickedness, about what it takes to get to heaven. We need to change our mind about these things. When we change our mind, which, by the way, is the biblical definition of repentance, as a consequence of that change of mind, we infest our faith in Christ. We invest our heart in Jesus Christ and he thereby changes what we are in that wonderful transformation that we call salvation or some call conversion. What is conversion but a change in what you are from what you were? 
And that is the biblical definition of repentance. Changing what you think and what you believe. A change of mind. Many people incorrectly believe that repentance is changing what you do. But that's not correct. Repentance is not changing what you do. Repentance is changing what you think, which then in turn changes what you are, which then in turn changes what you do. In other words, turning from my sins is a consequence of repentance, but it is not the definition of repentance. If I repent, I'll turn from my sins. Now this is critically important when it comes to the doctrine of salvation, beloved, because salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. If repentance meant changing what you do, turning away from your sins, that would mean that in order to be saved, you'd have to turn away from your sins. But my contention is this, that you cannot turn from your sins until you're saved. Because verse number 5, we read it a moment ago, verse 6, verse 5, where was it? Verse 7. One of these verses. Ah, verse 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the, Lord of, uh, the, Lord, the, the law of God, and it cannot be. And so no one gets saved by cleaning up his life and turning over a new leaf. In fact, you can't do those things until you've been saved. Why? Because we must we cannot change what we are by changing what we do. We must change what we do by changing what we are. And since we can't change what we are, we must rely on him who can change what we are. And that is actuated when we change what we think in a process called repentance. And on the other side of the coin of repentance, imagine my hand is a coin, same hand, other side is faith. As I changed my mind, I now believe on him whom Christ God hath sent. And I invest my faith in him, and he changes what I am. Come back to verse 20 in chapter 7. Because most of us in this room understand these truths as they pertain to salvation. But the same truths pertain to sanctification and Christian living. You're already saved, but you struggle getting victory over sin. That struggle is not necessary because God has already changed what you are, thereby enabling you to change what you do. But the struggle comes in this, that we as Christians sometimes Try to change what we do in the strength of what we were instead of the strength of what we now are. We try to beat the flesh in the strength of the flesh. Paul said, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And the point is this, you can't beat the power of the flesh in the strength of the flesh. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In other words, even though I'm saved, I'm still living in the body of this death. It's still present with me until God removes me from the body of this death at the time of my physical death or at the time of my 
rapture when he translates me to a new body. Until then, I have to live with this body of death. And this body of this death rears its ugly head on a regular basis. On a daily basis. On an hourly basis. On a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The body of this death rears its ugly head. And so I still have to fight with my old nature and my old way of thinking. The old way of thinking, remember, suggests that we can please God by our works. The old way of thinking said you can get to heaven as long as you're good enough. But that's trying to change what we are by changing what we do in a practical sense and as Christians. We've been changed in what we are. We must now allow that change to affect what we do. Let me put it this way. If good works could not save you, why would we think for a moment that good works could make us right with God? If they could not save us when we were lost, they can't get us closer to God now that we're saved. You don't get closer to God by works. <clears throat> you get closer to God the same way you got saved, by faith. And so if you find yourself struggling with the flesh in a backslidden state, you're going to encounter this on a regular basis. The sad truth is that many Christians have a sort of system of penance where we try to make up for our own sins. We do something stupid, and so we think, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, uh, I just irritated my wife, so I'm going to buy her flowers. Or I'll do the dishes. Or I'll do something nice for her to make up for it. That is carnal thinking. That is the thinking, the old thinking. You can't make up for your sin. In a sense, you're trying to change what you are by changing what you do, and that never works. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does not say if you make up for your sin. You cannot make up for your sin. Christ has already made up for your sin, by the way. Do you really think you can do something better than Christ? If Christ has already made up for your sin, what in the world are you doing trying to make up for your own sin? It pales in comparison, doesn't it? We need to confess our sins, which means that we've changed our mind about our sins, to him who's faithful and just. We realize that he has already made up for those sins. And there aren't enough works we could do in a thousand eternities, in an eternity of eternities, that would ever make up for the least of our sins. Now someone along this point might suggest, but pastor, shouldn't we be doing good works? Yes, we should. <laughs> but in the newness of what we now are, not in the strength of what we once were. That's the entire point of Ephesians 2.10, that we've been created unto good works, and that God hath ordained that we should walk in them, in his strength. In other words, the works or what we do must be the product of what we now are. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's what we are. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. That's what we do. 
When we try to get victory over our sin by changing what we do, we're operating in the strength of what we were instead of in the strength of what we are. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. The way to be not conformed, but to be transformed, is by renewing your mind. Changing what you think. Changing your system of thinking. And there's no better way to do that than to be mindful always of his covenant, the word, which he commanded to a thousand generations. First of Chronicles 16, 15. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Psalm 119, verse 9. By taking heed thereto, according to thy word, with my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. In other words, I'm basking in what I now am. To change what I now will do. We cannot get victory over the flesh through the strength of the flesh. We cannot get victory over sin through human willpower. Willpower will last a, lo a little bit, but not long. Willpower always proves to be temporary. By the way, and I, I don't mean to dig on 12-step programs, but that's why 12-step programs are not in and of themselves sufficient. I'm not against 12-step programs, but they must accompany or be accompanied by the power of God. Because at the end of the day, the 12 steps won't change what you are, but God will change what you are. Amen. Come back to Romans 8. There is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's what we are. Who walk what we do after the flesh. Or not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Get this. We've got the law. Is there anything wrong with the law? The problem is not the law. So why, cannot, why can the law not do? Because it's weak through the flesh. When you try to abide by the law in the strength of the flesh, you're bound to fail. Therefore God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, changing what we are, who now walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Do you see, when you try to defeat the flesh in the strength of the flesh, you're still walking after the flesh. And when we're walking after the flesh, well, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so we have a catch-22 here when it comes to sin. For when we try to defeat the flesh in the strength of the flesh, it is therefore sin because it is not of faith. And in the very pursuit of trying to get victory over sin, we're actually sinning. Because we're relying on us instead of him. It's like, it would be like trying to get clean by taking a bath in the sewer. Yeah, who is right? It's, it's a disgusting thought 
to roll around in the sewer and scrub, 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 though you may, you're still coming out as filthy or more filthy than when you went in. That's what it is to try to get victory over the flesh and the strength of the flesh. You might as well take a bath in the sewer. Next time you find, face temptation, say, you know, I think I'd rather jump in the sewer. Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It does not say, stop fulfilling the lust of the flesh so that you can be spiritual. No. It's when we walk in the Spirit and we yield to the Holy Ghost that we'll no longer be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Keep this in mind. You can deprive your flesh for quite a long time. You can practice self-deprivation for weeks and never be spiritual. Look at all the religions that perpetuate self-deprivation. Are they spiritual? They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. We have no power over the flesh when we walk in the flesh. I preached last week. Some Sunday school people didn't even remember what I preached last week. So I'm guessing that some of you who weren't in Sunday school probably forgot to. I preached on the spirit and the power of Elias. And you'll recall that I preached on being full with the Holy Ghost. And hopefully you'll recall that I taught you that being filled with the Holy Ghost is not a matter of content. It's a matter of control. It's not filling the gasoline tank with gas. It's filling the driver's seat with a driver. The question for each of us to ask is, who is driving the car of my life? Listen to me. You can be driving the car of your life in the right direction. But if you're the one driving it, it's flesh. If you're the one in the driving seat, and here's the problem. Have you ever fallen asleep at the wheel in, in an actual car? You think that won't happen in your spiritual car? You see, we couldn't drive long enough in the quote-unquote right direction before we'd nod off and veer one way or the other and end up in the ditch. And then we'd pull our car out of the ditch, get it back on the road, get it back going in the right direction, and pat ourselves on the back because we're back on track. No, you're not if you're still in the driving seat. With all due respect, you're no more spiritual than you were when you're going the wrong way. Beloved, this is critical for the Christian victory. You'll never get victory in your life until you put the Holy Ghost in the driving seat of your the life of your car's life, the, the, the car of your life. The only solution is to get out of the driver's seat. Don't practice bumper sticker theology that says God is my co-pilot. Co means along with me. If God's my co-pilot, I'm his co-pilot. Get out of the driver's seat and get in the back seat. And don't be a back seat driver. Backseat driver always telling you where, where to go, when to stop. Oh, Lord, don't go that way. Lord, please don't take me that way. Well, what if the Lord wants you to go that way? You see, the Lord who neither slumbers nor sleeps, he'll always keep that car right on track, and he's the one in control. And so our problem with sin is our problem with our mind, the problem with thinking. Because when we think that we can handle it on our own, that's carnal thinking. What does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 10, 12? Can anybody quote it? Make it a memory verse this week. 
Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Problem with it, it was with the man's thinking. He thought he had it licked. He thought he had his temper licked. And all of a sudden, speaking of driving, somebody cut him off. And out of the abundance of his wicked heart, his mouth spoke. The problems with our thinking. If we change what we think, we'll change what we are. And if we change what we are, we'll change what we do. That's the way to victory. Are you the driver or are you the passenger? Will you stand with me, please?